Hey, welcome to Horsepower and feast your eyes on the fastest Pontiac powered drag car on the planet. It's a 1963 Tempest with a twin turbo 482 engine and it was dynoed at 2800 horsepower. Built by Rodney Butler and Travis Quillen, it runs the quarter mile in 6.27 seconds at more than 228 miles an hour. Well, today we're going to harness some of that technology to build an engine for our station wagon sleeper project. One we started recently with this 78 Buick Century. Nice straight body, solid frame, but far from what we envision in the power department. We started this project by removing the weak factory V6 the transmission and just about everything else underneath. We gave it a set of Rytec coilover shocks, upper and lower control arms, and muscle car sway bars front and rear. We added some reinforcement of our own. So what can we put in this thing to make it a vicious yet streetable sleeper? Well, here's the plan. We're going to build a 461 Pontiac turbo engine with a horsepower target of 800 plus. After combing the one ads, we closed the deal on a used Pontiac 400 engine just for the block. Casting numbers confirmed it was produced in 1973. That's good. You see 400 blocks cast before 1975 have thicker walls and can handle more power. Butler Performance in a little town called Leoma, Tennessee has earned an international reputation as the go-to place for high-performance Pontiac parts, rotating assemblies, and engines. It was founded by Jim Butler, who shares his Pontiac passion and expertise with sons David and Rodney. People saw us race, wanted the engine work, and uh, that's how it got started. Today, their engines go in just about everything from restored show-and-go muscle cars to all-out race cars. Now, the first order of business for our 400 block is converting it from two bolt to four bolt mains. Now that begins with changing out the dowel pins, then drilling and tapping for the additional studs. Uh, the factory cast caps, even four bolt main, you still had a weak point in the cast cap itself. So when we go to the billet cap, it actually makes the bottom end itself stiff. These billet caps came from Mylodon, and here's why you can't just bolt them on and go. That overlap there would never allow the crank to even spin. So after painting the block for rust protection, the next critical steps are boring and honing the main caps. This is an interference cut, which means Ronnie the machinist only cuts the cap half of the bore. It's very crucial that he only takes a little bit of material away at a time. It's a little different than some of the other blocks, especially in the thrust area. Um, you, you have to know what you're doing with that uh, area. You can. Uh, you cut too much, and, and once you cut the block, you know, you're done. And on the final pass, he leaves about five thousandths. Now, that way, all the mains can be line honed to the exact same size. Next, the fixture and collets come out to get ready for line honing. Not before some thorough deburring, though. After reinstalling and torquing the billet caps, it's time to work on the fronts and rear which involves cutting the sides to ensure getting a straight 90 degree war cut. Then after cutting down the mating surfaces, Ronnie's ready for the final line honing. Again, it's a little bit of honing, measuring, well there's five thousandths, and a little more honing. At three thousandths, he's almost there. Then we can go on to the usual cylinder bore and hone work. The rest of our machining is pretty routine. With the Elderbrock heads and its turbo application, there's really not a lot to do. We're going to clean the heads up, um, just clean the ports up, do a port match for the intake and the exhaust, really flow well out of the box. We're using a forged rotating kit from Eagle. The weights, of course, represent the piston and rod weight. By spinning everything up at 500 RPM, he can detect any imbalance, and the machine will tell him where to add or remove weight. In our case, a little bit's got to come out. By the way, our bottom end combination will give the turbo engine a four and a quarter stroke. With the longer stroke engine, this thing makes a lot of torque and makes it instantly. So uh, with a heavy street car, it's going to be uh, a handful on the street. 
Horsepower is back and so is our freshly machined Pontiac 400 block. How, you might ask, can we expect to make 800 or so horsepower starting with a foundation like this? Well, for starters, how about a Turbonetics air-to-air -air turbocharging system? Then, of course, the Edelbrock high-flowing port-matched heads. And, of course, the heart of our rotating assembly, that forged crank with a four-and-a-quarter stroke. Well, before we get down to business, Dave, what do you think of this combination? Well, I think it's going to be a lot of fun in the uh, station wagon. Um, it's going to make a lot of power. So many of our customers are doing a lot of the same thing with modern components, EFI, things like that, in their older cars. Uh, the horsepower is going to be great, but the torque is going to be uh, really something to see, I think. Now, when we were at the Butler's, we actually showed you how these Milodon steel caps are fitted, bored, and honed. Now, that's one size. Once you get ready to assemble and you put the bearings in, you need to go ahead and check again. On a high horsepower turbo application like this, if you don't, you're going to waste a lot of money. The numbers are all good, so we can remove the cap and be sure to keep them in order. Now, some silicone in these holes and on the edge of the new rear main seal from BOP. It's a big improvement over the factory rope seal, which breaks down and leaks over time. Now, a liberal coating of assembly lube on the other bearings Okay. before we drop in our Eagle crank. It came with an ESP armor finish that's designed to extend the bearing life, and it also sheds oil from the counterweights while they're spinning. The rear main cap gets an extra dab of silicone before it goes back in place. Then we can install the other main caps. Our pistons are a float and pin design and we're installing them with a set of Total Seal stainless rings. The assembly goes into the number one cylinder so we can degree the camshaft after it's installed. Now on most street camshafts, the exhaust duration is usually equal to or greater than the intake duration at 50 thousandths. Now this camshaft's gonna be the exact opposite. We're running what they call a reverse duration split as well as a 114 degree wide lobe separation angle. Now what that's gonna do is minimize overlap as well as intake reversion due to the back pressure on the turbo. Well, in case you don't have a degree in mechanical engineering, here's what all that meant. With the boost being shoved into the cylinder with the turbo, well, your valves have to dance a little bit differently, but you don't have to know the steps. Your machinist or manufacturer can hook you up with the right cam. In fact, Butler spec this comp cams grind at 252 intake, 245 exhaust at 50 thousandths. Gross valve lift is 540 and 541. Okay, now because we put new caps on this block, we actually bored it and honed it, we raised the center line of the crankshaft just a little bit. Now, in order to keep our valve timing correct, we had to go with the 10,000 shorter chain to keep the stretch from putting our cam timing all over the place. Now that we've degreed the cam, we can move on to the rest of the rotating assembly, and that includes these Eagle connecting rods to match their crank. Now, piston choice is pretty critical with a turbo application. These Ross Forge pistons have extra strength here in the skirt area. Little weight taken out here, and notice how the top ring is lowered to help with heat transfer. Butler deburred all these edges to prevent detonation, and this design is all about lowering compression to eight and a half to one to accommodate for the boost and keep the engine pump gas friendly. Go ahead, John. This timing cover from Ames Performance goes on next to finish up the front of our block. And this little piece is to hold the end of the dipstick in place. We're using a spacer with this Pro Pump oil pump. This will help give us the correct pump to pan clearance we need. Notice anything missing? Like the shaft? It goes on later. We're making sure we have at least 15 thousandths clearance between each rod end. We've got 24, so we're good to go. This one-piece reusable gasket from BOP is new to Pontiac engines. We're using it on a Mylodyne oil pan with kickouts for a seven-quart capacity. And we're a big step closer to filling our sleeper wagon with some big horse turbo power. We're back to continue filling this hole in our Buick Century sleeper wagon. So far, we've added some top shelf components to our Pontiac block, like a balanced forged crank, custom grind camshaft, a set of forged turbo-ready pistons and rods. Then we finished up the bottom end with a slightly shorter timing set, oil pump, and pan. So now onto the top end. And after oiling the lifter bores, we can fill them with comp retrofit hydraulic lifters. 
You've seen us use Edelbrock performer heads many times before. They always work right out of the box. But Butler Performance has taken these several steps further, not only port matching, but giving them a valve job, deburring and polishing the combustion chambers. Then up on top, they gave them stiffer comp valve springs with titanium retainers. Plus, there are four oil return holes in each head. They go in and touch them up to improve the flow. Butler even designed this cometic multi-layered steel gasket and we've added copper coat spray sealant between each layer. ARP head studs are a must in an ultra high performance application like this. And after we lower the heads into place, we can add washers and nuts which we pre-coated with ultra torque assembly lube. Remember the missing oil pump drive? Here it is, a little longer than stock to compensate for the spacer we added earlier. The rest of our comp valve train includes these push rods and a set of 1.5 ratio ultra gold roller rocker arms. And after lashing them down, we can bolt down the valley pan. We're running an Edelbrock Torker 2 intake manifold on this engine for a couple of reasons. The first one is to give us our torque and drivability we need down low for a street engine. The second, it already has machine bosses in it for the injectors. Now with these fuel rails, it's designed to run a Pico style injector, which is a short compact unit, but we can only find it with a flow rate of up to 52 pounds an hour, and that's not gonna be enough. So we stepped up to these Trick Flow Specialties 120 pound an hour and had to raise the fuel rails. We also had to cut a section out here and add this piece the line to get a little extra clearance for the throttle linkage. Other than that, the intake's been port matched to the cylinder heads down at Butler's. We're bolting up this mechanical water pump from Mylodon next. Then the crank pulley bolts up to the harmonic balancer. All these drive pulleys, billet brackets, and even the alternator came in a March performance kit we got from O'Reilly Auto Parts. Here's another accessory we'll need with our turbo application a vacuum pump that improves ring sealing while preventing blow-by and detonation. Before we drop on the valve covers, we'll add some assembly spray that coats the rockers and push rods to protect them during initial startup. I guess we don't have to tell you who made these cool aluminum valve covers. Now that we've got the vacuum pump plumbed up and the belts installed, time to transfer the engine to a dyno car. We want to fire it up and run it naturally aspirated first, so we can seat the rings and make sure we don't have any fluid leaks. After bolting up a set of Hooker Super Comp headers, we can prime the oiling system and drop in an MSD Pro Billet distributor for this Pontiac application. It's definitely getting easier to do the turbo stuff. It used to be you had turbo kits for Mustangs and that was it. But now, you know, you got a turbo going in a Buick wagon with a Pontiac engine, so you can, you can put a turbo in anything now. With timing set at 32 degrees before TDC, the engine fires up perfectly the first time. By the way, we're feeding it for now with a Holley 850 car. After the warm up period, we're making several 6,000 RPM pulls. It's making great power. Eight and a half to one motor, 461 inches, made 430 horsepower, 485 foot pounds of torque. Instant torque, even without that the turbo. That thing is a beast. <laughs> it's going to break 800 easy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guessed it, the turbo's next. You're watching Horsepower. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Horsepower collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. The Butler Brothers did it again, laying the foundation for our stout Pontiac small block. They even massaged this aluminum performance heads. After we topped it with a multi-port EFI intake, it made a ferocious 430 horses naturally aspirated. Now we're ready to get blown away. Mike and John spent the whole day fabbing up tubes for the turbo, just for the dyno runs. The system comes from Turbonetics and includes a new gen wastegate that diverts exhaust gases from the turbine to control turbo speed. This is Turbonetics' new 76 millimeter mid-frame turbo, made of forged billet with a 75 millimeter turbine at 1.14 air ratio. From it, a charge pipe connects to the Spearco air-to-air -air intercooler, and another charge connects to this Godzilla bypass valve assembly. It's for surge protection to the throttle body. We chose Holly for the entire EFI system, starting with the HP EFI. Now it's fully tunable and we're running ours in a multi-port setup. 
We invited Robin Lawrence of Holly Performance to hang out with us while we get the system up and running. We're seeing this thing, you know, from the average, uh, you know, uh, Chevelle, that big block that somebody wants to have fuel economy to, you know, guys with two 2,500 horsepower turbocharged or procharged uh, combinations. Using their software, you can load up the engine specs like cubic inches, the rev limiter settings, and sensor information to name a few. We're removing the plugs to spin the engine to prime the turbo. It's a must before the first fire up. Failure to do this can result in bearing damage or worse. Now it's Robin's turn. Okay. With the engine up to temperature, we'll enter the fuel learn table. The yellow cursor represents the RPM the engine is running. Notice the small numbers populating and becoming more steady? This system has learning capabilities and it's building a table based on our targeted air fuel ratio. You're creeping, You're creeping, right? Rock and roll. We're starting with four and a half pounds of boost and working our way up to 11. Yeah, it's happy. It's real happy. Please see for power. 475, 82. It's up to you. We'll just keep creeping. We made a lot of pulls, slowly adding boost and gaining horsepower. 547, 631. We're currently up to seven pounds. 5.4, 6.3, 6.8. Seven. Pipe, come on. Yep. We knew this temporary tubing could be a problem, but we learned that everything is working fine. I know we came up some because it's 602, 498. We can't help ourselves for trying for a few more pounds. At this point, we're just wasting fuel. But at only seven and a half pounds, yeah, baby, we got 652 horsepower. <laughs> the tubing for the wagon will be solid, so the chassis dyno will show the true power of Project Sucker Punch.